Morning all, there was a very exciting game played yesterday in the FIDE Grand Prix which caught my attention. Playing white was Boris Gelfand, playing black Dmitry Andrekin. So let's see the game, it was a Queen's Engine defence, d4, e6, inviting still the possibility of a French defence, but uh, Boris plays c4, after knight f6, if knight c3 then we have the normal Nimzo engine defence. Knight f3 is just as frequent nowadays for the Queen's engine defence. Black's idea is still usually to try and control that e4 square. So this next move, b6, is very, very common. White plays g3. Most popular here in this particular position is actually bishop a6 though, looking at c4 against White's Finchetto, because the bishop's going to go here, seemingly ne neglecting this diagonal a little bit. This is actually quite popular, bishop a6, over 11,000 games, over 6,000 with bishop b7. So this this is the more classical kind of Nimzo Indian idea of controlling the e4 square. We see bishop g2, and now black plays a fairly standard move, c5. It's the third most popular, usually actually bishop e7 is played here, over 5,000 games, or even bishop b4 check c5 and white often castles here but there is a gambit idea introduced by Gary Kasparov which is now played d5 and usually the implementation of this here is black takes if black doesn't take then it's going to be really annoying if bishop e7 we can play d6 so black takes uh, this pawn and the usual way of playing this gamut, uh, which was played a lot by Gary Smith with great success, is to play knight h4 here. And one of the ideas is why it's going to regain the pawn, but also try and get an aggressive knight to f5. A knight on f5 is one of Gary Smith's favourite locations for an attacking knight. And we see in some Smith's games some, some fantastic attacking masterpieces uh, here. But uh, in this game the implementation is is very different actually instead of knight h4 Boris actually played a much rarer move that's 250 games in live book with knight h4 36 actually with knight g5 this next one is only 19 taking here so it's still a gambit it's kind of locked in the bishop this by playing for d5 it's giving black a pawn here an immediate thing to notice is if knight takes d5, this is bad news. White can actually put pressure on d5 with that pin and protect g2. And this is important here because a tactic like knight c3 is not working, you know, hitting the bishop. Um, white can just take this and then have a recapture. So any way, any other way of exploiting the pin is, is not sufficient. Uh, knight, knight g5. We can either have knight c3 or even stronger here, knight e3, and it backfires. So black could uh, take this bishop. And actually black's doing very well there, of course. So, um, yeah, bishop takes d5 is needed here. I think we still have this problem of d6. If bishop e7, d6 is pretty unpleasant. So bishop takes d5. Knight c3. So we're in a strange gambit territory against the Queen's engine here. Quite a rare gambit territory. And I think that that's, makes this game very interesting. It's a very, very high level game. So bishop c6 was played. And now simply e4. So white's marking out the d5 square. And offering another pawn. And the engine actually, Stockfish engine, is saying take the pawn, take the pawn. Uh, a human to take two pawns in an opening it seems to be a violation of, of general principles. Let's have a quick look. Usually the pawn is not taken. Usually d6 is played, like in the game. But uh, taking the pawn does seem incredibly uh, materialistic. A simple thing, it seems, for white to do here is just take the knight to get this pin with queen e2, which causes some congestion issues for black here, uh, because d5 and f5 are not really on the cards. To d5, knight d2, and white is getting a huge advantage here, because look at this diagonal. So say, you know, like this, takes, it's just horrendous, ouch. 
and say uh, f5, I think we could just play f3. So that's horrendous. So basically, it's forcing congestion with queen e7. So two pawns gambit here. Very strange territory indeed, to those who haven't seen it before. So where is the value of, of, the, of the double pawn sack? Well, we've got, we see congestion here. If we just castle, now let's let's say black tries to Fianchetto. Bishop g5 is actually crushing here, absolutely crushing. Um, if if we take here, take we're on we're on the rook. That's that's not really uh, that good. This this position, or even stronger to check first, and actually even stronger to play h4, and then <laughs> take it's it's nasty. No, so the two pawns are pretty dangerous here, and say g6. So bishop g5. What does black play here? If f6, bishop takes f6. Yes, it's it's nasty. You can see it's nasty there, and so black in this position has to play very precisely. Maybe a move like knight c6, and we get a position like this, where I'm not entirely sure. After queen d1, say now, introducing pressure on the e file. It's not entirely sure how black completes development for the moment. <laughs> it, it just seems a very dangerous position. So say say g6 here. There's actually knight e5. So striking on that diagonal. It can lead easily to an advantage for white. The engine suggests this is actually a tenable position for black. Uh, it is two pawns up. And it starts to look a little bit more solid after bishop e6. So I guess if black really omits to play g6 until until it's absolutely possible, safeguarding the diagonal first with rook c8, prophylaxis, e file doesn't look too devastating. This position seems as though uh, black might be in prospect to play g6 one day. But uh, again, there's always knight e5. Yeah, it just seems a very, very difficult position, a double pawn gambit here. So incredible territory to explore, relatively unexplored gambit territory here. So we see the move d6, which is the more common move being played by Andrikin. So is this venomous for black? Well, let's have a look at what happened. White castled, bishop e7. At least black's getting to castle, it looks okay. Or is he? Because after knight h4, is this tolerable to allow knight f5? Black's best it seems might be to castle to allow knight f5 but white now has the idea of bishop f4 on d6 and against this it seems what, what does black do say, say say g6 we can take here and bishop f4 and we can build up on that backward d pawn there seems to be adequate compensation here with that miserable miserable backward d pawn um, and even if white doesn't put further pressure on it here, knight d5, uh, this, this starts to look dangerous on this diagonal potentially. Uh, and what does black do here? It seems white's got very strong uh, dark square pressure here. It's like a bad king's engine without the Vincenzo bishop. For example, like this, there seems to be uh, great pressure for white. Fantastic compensation. So yes, so we see here black not exceptionally happy to castle in this position. He could either lose this bishop or there could be torture on d6 or both. Lose the bishop, torture on d6 and torture on dark squares later generally. He actually plays g6. This might not, this might not be the least uh, worst move in this, in this scenario because now after bishop h6 it seems a, a fairly straightforward move that most club players would play to prevent casting. Black's forfeiting ca casting rights. So all this for just one pawn to have this position. So what does black do here? So bishop f8. So okay maybe he's pleased to manually castle and it looks superficially is the king going to get to g7 it will be okay. Well, let's see. Queen d2 is a kind of double attack on queen.
queen h for queen h6 being useful but also for targeting maybe uh, d6 but also tactically here e5 could be useful for opening up this diagonal hitting the knight so there's a lot of dangers here we're just building up on d6 so there's a lot of ideas here in this position after queen d2 a very flexible attacking move uh, so what does black do as an example say black plays king g7 here we could just torture d6 and there seems to be enough compensation for white uh, here for example it's a pretty miserable position white can even regain the pawn um, and that that looks to be very advantageous for white this position uh, so this this is uh, difficult for black to play to say the least okay so king g7 wasn't played actually after queen d2 we see the move knight e8 and now rook ad1 so black's passive okay but now after king g7 is this the idea that it doesn't look so bad d6 is covered the king doesn't seem to be in grave danger or is it white now plays f4 and usually uh, a plan such as f4 it's using the default position of the rook after casting so it's supported by the rook the idea of f5 but f5 usually weakens e5 and sometimes against the Benoni um, opening often e5 is played as a prelude to f5 to lock up the e5 square and also you know liberate this bishop and for white to have access to the e4 square as a pivot square you usually play e5 and then f5 and here we see after queen c8 uh, actually here after queen c8 in this particular position uh, there's less advantage in this particular position for e5 black's just unpinned for that d6 pawn uh, so if we played e5 now this might actually be not incredibly bad for black this kind of scenario uh, believe it or not even though it looks a little bit miserable you know taking this pawn there might be some it might be okay just about or even blacks might even be better after this because he controls the d4 square so e5 here after queen c8 in that particular position might not be the best timing so white actually plays knight d5 which introduces the possibility actually strongly of f5 and f6 supported by the knight on f6 and it also introduces the possibility of queen c3 check as an idea so we've still got ideas of e5 f5 and queen c3 now uh, so it's basically stopped the, the the bishop here taking out white's important light square bishop if black really wants to give up the bishop here this doesn't look too good on the light squares after queen takes d5 say say knight c6 white can blast that diagonal now with e5 this is very bad so it's nice to preserve that bishop and the potential for e5 with the bishop pressure without being exchanged off so knight d5 achieves that we see a rook f8 and it's here that both e5 and f5 in this position are, are both actually very strong attacking moves uh, both very promising actually boris plays e5 okay and <laughs> white is basically threatening f5 f6 uh, um, among other things as well as e takes potentially and queen c3 check being dangerous <clears throat> so here yes it's becoming very very critical uh, for black d takes e5 is played and now f5 and it just looks like an attacking player's dream position although it's two pawns down um, it's really uh, incredibly dangerous for f6 check now uh, or even fg has stuff going for it uh, both of these are great possibilities uh, black actually played queen d8 uh, but the stronger one is actually f6 check and it seems here if king h8 i think black's going to get mated or something quite quickly or nearly queen h6 looking at the rook and knight takes we can just take there so say uh rook g8 here knight f3 threatens now knight g5 
for mating on h7. So saying knight takes, knight takes. This is horrendous after knight g5. Black's completely busted. Um, because if, if here, then we can just take here winning the queen. Okay, so in the game, it's not much better actually. Knight takes f6 is played. And a very, very strong move is played in this position. Can you guess, if I give you five seconds, what would you play here with white? Okay, knight f5 check. Now, interesting, if the king uh, goes back here, queen h6, we're threatening mate. If rook g8, we just, we can just take here. And, sorry, <laughs> this is the game continuation. Uh, so knight f5 check, king h8 was actually played. Pardon me. So queen h6, threatening mate, rook g8, and now just knight takes f6. These are all the, the strongest moves in this line. So queen takes, just loses. Black resigned in this position. He's faced with a mate in one. And if queen takes f6, we play knight d6. So we're on that f7, and we're hitting the queen. Uh, basically, it's, it's absolutely terrible. You know, queen g7, knight takes f7, winning the queen. Brutal game, absolutely brutal game. Uh, but you know, where else did the king want to go? Um, if king g8, then it's not much better. Queen here, say takes here. Knight takes, even more simple, we're forced to be winning the queen. And you might think, well, g takes doesn't help. Check, king here, knight takes f6. And we're threatening queen h6. We're also threatening to win the queen. What does black do here? Now say knight d7, what we do, we want to play, uh, effectively, we want to play queen h6 without losing the knight. White has, for example, rook takes, and then queen h6 to force black to give up the queen. Uh, so yeah, it's a double attack here, a double idea, rather. Queen, queen h6, rook takes d8, not very pleasant. Uh, so yeah, this is absolutely end of game after knight f5. It's a very, very short grandmaster game, uh, to say the least, for what happens. Yes, after queen h6. Rook g8, it's kind of weakness of the last move that actually this f file is now majorly significant. Notice these guys spectator pieces. <laughs> but yeah, black was two pawns up, but this is a phenomenal attack. But even when... Um, you know, when white was just a pawn down, the initiative already seemed very, very dangerous. So I think this is new territory, new attacking territory, uh, relatively unexplored in this gambit system, which usually white plays knight h4. White just taken on d5, and it's very, very interesting. Maybe black's best is to take on e4, and then try and lock things up very, very carefully. Very carefully indeed, getting off the diagonal, putting the bishop here, hoping for the best, sitting tight for a while. Because this position has its own big downside to the backward d6 pawn. Um, knight coming to f5 is not very pleasant here. If black castles, it seems. Um, well, just, just generally, a knight coming to f5 is, is just not great. So, yeah, a very interesting game. Setting out, maybe emphasizing some important gambit territory against the Queen's Engine defense. I mean, I think this will be in the books basically for the future Queen's Engine books, because it just seems um, very, very attacking, uh, attractive attacking game. Um, no, even here, by the way, the strength of the white position is apparent that even f5 was strong. This this is plus two for white, even though he's two pawns down, so how can that be? Uh, say knight c6 here, e5, uh, to win that knight, and if black, whoops, if black doesn't um, play knight c6, or say, say knight d7, then black's king side again is under scrutiny, even in this line, even in this line. Say um, hg, this is like plus five for white, apparently, queen g5, threatening knight f5 check, and black's, you know, nearly like crumbling, for example, like this, knight e7, 
threatening rook takes f7 and queen g6. So there's different ways of crushing the black king position here. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. So rook takes f6 here. If here, then this loses the queen to check and rook takes g6. Yeah, there's a lot of tactics going on, even in this line, with the immediate um, f5. Um, f5. Very, very dangerous position indeed here. Even after fg and and queen, if fg, then rook takes, and this is also grim for black. Again, queen g5 here. Uh, if black tries to defend, uh, there's some slaughter variations. Basically, this this is a slaughter variation I looked at earlier. Uh, it'll be in the PGN if you're interested. But um, yeah, it seems the f file and white's attacking prospects are very very strong in in many of these variations. So. You might think, well, White had to play absolutely precisely. There's, there's just two ways to play this position, but this is the most elegant and the strongest, the easiest it seems to follow e5 thematically, just to play f5 here for f6. Uh, if knight f6, now we can just take, we can just take that, and here, you know, we're just going to slaughter the king. Yeah, it was just an overwhelming attack. Uh, Queen d8 f6. It looks as though Black temporarily was. You know, preventing this, but then we have this other mega tactic, this knight f5 check, a really, really crushing, impressive game um, from Boris Gelfand. If knight e8, queen takes f8. <laughs> yeah, you know, to defend the g7 square, knight e8, but unfortunately, queen takes f8. Yeah, so quite a crush. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.